I am an idiot. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can put that in the front. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Ruthless Levy. <laughs> Brent never knows what my name is, but I am one of your hosts of the Crypto Basic Podcast. And uh, welcome. It is November 1st, day after Halloween. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm here with Brent Philbin. Uh, AKA uh, my name is Brent Philbin. And hello. <laughs> AKA sexy stud thing from way back in the day. Thang, and then thang. Thang with an A. And then we got Kareem Baruke. I don't know what his old AIM names were, but you know, <laughs> was, but hey. Maybe Kareem he is knows. not old enough to use AIM. Did you ever use AIM, Kareem? Uh, I did. I did. You did? Yes. Damn, you were like 10 years old in that came That's out. right. That's right. <laughs> or not out, but when it like, like. My, dad, out of style. my sister was four years older, though, so I got to see what she did, and then I wanted to be cool, too. So there you go. Wait, you guys uh, aren't the same age? No, she's four I, years older than me. No, I meant no. Brent. <laughs> yeah, obviously your sister is the same age. Oh, no. Uh, Brent's, I was talking about Brent. uh, Brent's like, what? Uh, three, I'm 34. Yeah, you're my sister's age. Three days. Oh, wow. I always thought, Kareem, you were like Brent's like the same age. I mean, it's the beard. You know, the beard. No, it doesn't. For me, hey, when I had a beard, people were like, they, like it was either there. I was five years younger or five years older. Like either way, they just were like, oh, you're you're super young. You just have a beard, or you're super old. It was never actually what I was. <laughs> yeah. Well, K- Kareem has had that beard since he was 16 years old, playing in our uh, playing in our illegal poker games. So, not this beard. <laughs> Fair well, enough. Yeah. It's pretty. It was pretty close, though. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah hey welcome everybody uh what so we, we said it's halloween what did you what do you guys uh what, what do you guys wear we record like we're recording on halloween what are you guys wearing tonight uh i'm gonna be i actually just figured out like 10 minutes ago i'm gonna be the disco guy emoji which is my favorite emoji anyways and i have some sweet disco shirt and i have a mustache and i'm gonna wear a chain and it'll be good enough it'll are you fun. gonna do it in yellow face you do know that you can change tones of the emoji to your face, right, Brent? Come on, Brent. I'm not, I'm not an emoji I, expert. Oh, I'm my sorry. God. All my this emojis guy, are yellow. This guy talks about, like, all how he's he's got all these, like, cool tech gadgets and stuff, but he doesn't know that emojis have shades of people's actual faces. Yeah, yeah. This is Apple 2019. Talk, Adam. Adam, this is Apple Talk, okay? Samsung doesn't play these identity politics. Oh, oh Sam, yeah, yeah, Samsung. They're, they don't care. They're just like, here you go. It's, all the faces are yellow. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, sorry for the abrupt stop in that conversation. We realized Kareem was using his webcam mic instead of his four hundred dollar mic <laughs> that's in front just, of his face. Just wanted to see if y'all were paying attention, and congratulations, you are. I'm proud of you guys. We're staying skeptical. We're staying organized. <laughs> now let's continue all according to plan. Uh your 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 voice sounds so much more crisp now. Ah, so, uh, yes. This is just good news for everyone. The and, lesson there, Adam, is money buys everything, including yeah, a better voice. <laughs> there you go. And uh, also, how about money buying our way into a rapid fire? Ooh. With, uh, uh, no, let's 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 cut that one. I don't know. No, I, it's not. No, it's <laughs> perfect, no, Adam. No, 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 you stick with it. We, why, oh, my God. Every time I botch, it just has to be in it. Yeah, that's no, the yeah. We only you cut out your hundred it. ums per episode. We can't cut all that other stuff too. I've gotten better. I've gotten Especially, better. we're not going to cut a cheesy transition. It was yeah. just transition. Cheesy transitions yeah. are like our thing. That oh. so. Anyway, let's go ahead and return to the rapid fire. <laughs> uh, the money rapid fire. Speaking of the money, money. rapid fire, <laughs> of course. Remember, this is headlines that we see throughout the week, but we're not going to dive super deep into. Uh, who's gonna take the rapid fire, guys? Adam, that's you, right? That's your baby. No, that's uh, that's Brent this week. Brent. Well, yeah, Adam's talking next, so I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna I'm gonna talk about this. Here's the quick. It's gonna be actually quick though because I'm talking about it. So Bitcoin is 11 years old. It is happy it, it birthday. Is 11, happy birthday. It is a one we, and a one next to each other. Wait, I think it's tradition that we sing the entire happy birthday song 
Um, uh, now, uh, actually, Adam, Bitcoin is about breaking tradition and creating new paradigms. So we're going to continue. Yeah, I, I actually was never going <laughs> to do that, but I always get extremely like maybe not tilted, but frustrated when I have to somehow get forced into singing that song in a public setting. Well, I don't know why. It's just like, it just gets to me where I'm like, all right, everyone. And it's like, I barely know this guy. I'm just singing this dumb song. Or I have to act like uh. See, I even, I even infiltrated Brent's rapid fire. So funny story about happy. So my dog used to sing happy birthday. He's dead, but he used to uh-huh. like, it was like his thing that he loved to do. If you sang happy birthday, he would like, how long with you? I don't know why he did it every day of his life. And then what happened is my dad, now every time I've ever been out to dinner with him and somebody does like a birthday at another table, he starts howling. So it's not <laughs> like anybody else in the restaurant knows that that's what my dog did. <laughs> so he just goes, oh! and everybody looks at him. It's like, what are you doing? He thinks it's hilarious. Uh, it is hilarious. He's making himself <laughs> laugh. And maybe you, if you're there, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's like great. Uh, it's really hilarious as a fly on the wall. But not yeah. in as the person that's sitting there of like, oh god. Next to that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So Bitcoin's eleven years old. That was our that was our crypto basic happy birthday. And speaking of people important in Bitcoin, the the Mount Gox refunds have been pushed back a little bit to spring twenty twenty. So like they're coming. It's been like eight years. Y'all can wait a little bit longer. Uh something like that. I don't even know how long it's been a long time. The old Magic the Gathering online exchange sons of anyway yep so those are coming uh i haven't looked into it because i wasn't on mount gox i don't know if they're coming in bitcoin or if they're coming in cash but yeah that so uh we got congressman tom emmer has introduced a bill to limit the sec's reach on crypto so but the thing is the way u.s politics were introducing a bill really isn't anything necessarily so we'll see if that actually goes anywhere if it does we'll do a deep dive for now it's just some guy putting in a bill and that's that's what happens uh interesting random anecdote not anecdote sorry that posting from the substratum community they were able to dig up remember how we always said that justin tab took the funds from substratum and bought a house Mm -hmm. well it actually was a 1.5 million dollar mansion that he bought and they found the property on like you know the public records or whatever and then they like were able to basically look at the time of closing and see that it coincided with tweets that he was making that were saying, oh, look at the huge wall on Substratum, better buy on Twitter that are still there. He hasn't deleted them. So it's definitely interesting. That company has completely imploded. They are no longer even pretending to develop it. It's on a volunteer basis only. They have no money left. They ran out of all their money, mainly because their CEO is buying mansions. So I got to interrupt here to ask you a question. Brent, I know we're not wants to you know toot our own horns but i believe it's time to go beep beep yeah, yeah. all right you know what i'm saying we've we've had two specific episodes about this we've talked we've shit all over this coin a bunch of different times this it was easy it was an easy one mm-hmm. to to call it early yeah but just put it on the list you know substratum cryptopia tether a few others, I think you named. It's, well, it's to be our fair, official Tether superpower. Hasn't blown, well, Tether up hasn't blown up or anything. <laughs> right. But. but I feel like our official superpower is we can't tell you if a coin is good or not, but we could definitely spot if a coin is shit or not. <laughs> right. <it>. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then finally, a. <laughs> so I, I didn't put this one on here. <laughs> I saw DMT and I was like, oh, this is going to get interesting. But a German engineering consultancy uh, called DMT, I guess. <laughs> has launched CERA, C-E-R-A, a blockchain-based certification scheme that tracks raw materials. And actually, we're going to go into that a little bit, and we're going to talk about some other blockchain tracking a little bit later in the day. But this is with Volkswagen, mm. and they're tracking like their raw parts, so that's kind of cool. Brent, they're on the advisory board. Volkswagen and the United Nations are on the. I should have, you know, I maybe I should have done this one. I also tried to get you with a little typo that I, I kind of could have fixed. It says blockchain based, but you didn't read it. It's a oh, no. <laughs> you actually the perfect, perfect the perfect it. crime, the perfect the crime. perfect crime. But like, yeah, you ended up just, you know. Have you guys ever done that? Uh, that little exercise where you read a paragraph and all of the letters in the middle are jumbled up yes. but the outside letters stay 
Yeah, you can yeah. read it all perfectly. Yeah, your brain just looks at the big yeah. picture. Yeah. We're Look, talking I about don't fix day. typos. I don't know if you guys have noticed that when I like send messages, I literally just leave it. And then there's times where people are like, "What are you saying?" And I'm like, "Oh, I guess I might have should have fixed that one because it <laughs> makes no sense." But yeah, I just don't. I don't fix them. I just keep going. Not worth it. Not worth it at all. And and people get upset at me. They're like, "You got to look professional and all that." I'm like, "I'm probably I'm making I'm responding to 200 emails in an hour." Sorry, I'm. I just don't. I don't right click on the red line. I, I get too. I get. I don't even want to touch it's my mouth. Really too much work. Too it's much not work. Hard. Adam. Adam. It's too much work. Let's it's too much work right clicking. He's just all about the, you know, Listen, he just wants when, to left click and you, you have any idea how many clicks that finger has to do in a single hour, Adam? You can't just add a bunch of more clicks. I mean, you could also book. just solve it by not screwing up to begin with. No, you're asking for injury here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> not screwing up to begin with. I don't understand. Yeah. Anyway. So why do I process so many emails all the time? It's because I am powered by Wild Foods, and they get me going. And they, <laughs> Wild Foods is a company that is sponsoring the show, and they focus on real food, single ingredients, high-quality ingredients, more importantly, from small farms across the world, sustainable ingredients. We're going to talk more about sustainable ingredients a little bit later. Unintentional circle back to Wild Foods, even though we don't sell any meat. And they have coffee, they have tea, they have adaptogenic mushroom extracts that you can put in your coffee and do all kinds of stuff. So check them out. You can go to wildfoods.co. And if you use the code CryptoBasic12, which nobody's ever done, but if you do, you can you can get 12% off your order. And that'll be cool. It'll be like, wow, they've actually uh, gotten a return on their investment finally. <laughs> Wow, this but, is this sounds like such a great pitch, Brent. It's like everything sounds great. Oh yeah, but also no one's ever bought it. And now uh, yeah. <laughs> you, could, you just you could just leave that part out and just like you know just hope that someone does it. Listen, I'm just saying, like you are you are basically the blockchain you are completely transparent i am transparent everything if you had nose tampon up your nose you have to let everyone know this is something that you can't not <laughs> yep as jj likes to say what do you think i'm cnn whenever uh she thinks that she's talking too much <laughs> I don't know why. that's funny so anyway yep that's it that's uh so use the code crypto basic 12 be the first one to use the code you'll get 12 percent off your order and the stuff is really good. I understand that it's not a whole lot of alignment with uh, with this particular space. And of course, once we get a better, you know, a sponsor is more aligned, we'll replace them. Dude, but I actually think you are underestimating the crypto space and also just gaming space and like nerds in general. They like cool shit that helps their brain out, like nootropics, which go the that's, cocoa that's tropics what mushrooms great. are. Yes, yeah. that's what mushrooms. Well, There's a lot of things. Is- Coffee is great to fast with. I, I, I look at data, day. Adam. The data is that our listeners don't like it so far, but we're going to fix that. It's going to happen. <laughs> Brent, I brought you out of it. I he brought did. You out he of he it. did. Why did you? And then you just pushed down again. Oh, my this God. This is the longest ad of all time. Okay. Oh, my no, God. This has to be edited. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So, yeah, anyway, wildfoods.co, crypto basic 12 for 12% off your order. You can get that, that real food to you real fast. So, all right. Let's talk about Uber, boys. All right. So Uber is creating its own payment service called Uber Money. They really went out on a limb for that one with the originality of it. So on Monday of this week, October 28th, Uber launched its own payment service. And it's initially aimed towards its 4 million drivers. Not it's I don't I don't think yeah, it's not available to the you know the the people who actually want the Ubers, only the drivers right now, and it's actually it's actually good because it, you can store money, tra- uh, track transaction history, make electronic payments. But one of the cool features is it has overdraft protection of up to one hundred dollars. So if you're someone who's just flat broke and like I need to you know Uber, but I need to get gas in my car to Uber then it will allow you to kind of get started by giving you up to $100 instead of like a high interest loan or something is what they said. 
And uh, I mean, do you want to get your paycheck up to an hour early? <laughs> Swipe up. There you go. I mean, I kind of get it though, because uh, a lot of the reasons why someone might start driving for Uber is because they need money. So all of a sudden, if they have to put seventy dollars worth of freaking gas in there or something, that's a good point. Just to drive, it's kind of irritating. And um, then I assume they can, you know, pay it back as they go. Uh, there's no cryptocurrency element. So why is it on this show? Well, yeah. I happen to think that it is very relevant to, you know, just blockchain because these crypto, as it says in the article, is that the finan- these financial firms are, sorry, there are financial firms. They're improving their own tech. You know, we kind of forgot, hey, about these companies as they've also been progressing as well as crypto and they had a lot more money and infrastructure to catch up to anything that crypto is doing from like a good you know from a technology standpoint so i think it'll be an interesting battle i think there's going to be a lot more companies bigger companies like uber that are not using cryptocurrency and that could be an issue for the space but we'll see how you know it, it goes yeah, I, I think maybe one of the possible silver linings here could be so there we we should expect a lot of these companies and major corporations to have their own competitive digital currency, even if it's not blockchain based, right? But maybe one of the good things that can emerge from that is that the corporate structures that have such a hold on the narrative they will be promoting essentially private monies. Like they will make the concept, hey, Uber dollars and maybe Google dollars and Apple, that's a thing. It's totally fine to have your own kind of unit of currency, which I think would make the average person less apprehensive about Dash or Cardano or Ethereum or Bitcoin, right? Because it's like, hey, there's all kinds of private monies. Some of, and just some of these are blockchain-based and some of them aren't. So I don't know, maybe... Yeah, we'll see. And um, Or it could make a direct comparison. When Uber does something that they don't like, they're like, well, I don't like that they took their little Uber money and did this thing. And you're like, oh, well, then you can just do this. And then you don't have to worry about that. Well, so they were talking about – so Peter Hazelhurst. I have no idea to say that last name, but what's new? They, he's the head of Uber Money. He actually told CNBC that he wanted to help everybody understand that there's a new part of Uber focused on financial services. And the mission was to kind of like – give people access to the type of financial service they were excluded from. So we're actually talking about like banking the unbanked in spots where there's Uber, but maybe not like these people don't have banks, which seems kind of, I mean, I guess that's possible. Maybe in India or something. Yeah. I'd be so scared to put my money in Uber yeah. coin because no. they're like barely functioning as a company as it is. They're operating in the red, not in the way that like Amazon's operating in the red, but they're like, constantly in need of more funding girls yes. are gonna go broke no, and yeah. look at, at the end of the day this is about like interest right the interest of bitcoin and the bitcoin network are bitcoin when you have a company like a corporation like uber that has uber money it's like disney dollars like the, their only purpose is to serve the company because the company is structured in such a way that it has to follow its own interests its own financial interests so like it's kind of like when a major uh, corporation buys a, like a newspaper or CNN or something. And you're, okay, well, then it's not going to be a good media thing. A currency that's privately owned by one corporation is not going to be a good currency. It's just going to be a good method for them to control or incentivize traffic through them for them in their business model. Yeah, I agree. And uh, to bookend this segment. The industry observers, they think it's a way to bind users to the platform and they can keep them engaged in like kind of like a customer retention play. And I think that's a really, it's a really good, interesting point. And I think they, they actually, in the article, they said super apps, which I didn't really exactly get what they meant. Like they used in quotation, like trying to create a super app. And I think essentially it's saying, hey, I'm Uber. Now you can, you're on, you have a bank account here and maybe you can actually use that money for Uber Eats and then maybe you can use it for something else. And then maybe you can use it for, you know, another partnership with another big company. So I think you know, we're, it's going to be some weird, you know, maybe in uh, three to five years, everyone's just going to have, instead of using 
iPhone or, you know, or like everyone's just going to have like, everyone's just going to use everything through Uber or everything's going to use something through Amazon or Apple or something. It should be interesting. Well, I, I random anecdote of how this actually works in a place where it, I was fine with it. There's a place here called Pinballs in Austin. And they're like a Dave and Buster's, but the cards, you can use them to buy alcohol. So when you like load your gaming card, you can still use the dollars to like go get your beer or go get your food or whatever. So they've they've done that successfully in their own little ecosystem. Amazon's done it successfully, so who knows? Amazon, this little pinball bar. I mean, they're they're tracking, you know, upwards, both of them. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's like the Dave and Buster's model. I, Always Sunny is I had, remember Patty's Bucks? If you guys ever watch Always Sunny, they had an entire episode where they try to I think they're at a, like a Dave and Buster's and they're like, oh, this is genius. You, you just trap everybody in, but they give out the money for free. So they just end up giving a bunch of free alcohol. <laughs> when people go <laughs> cash in. That's funny. And uh, Brent, would you like to talk about the travels of Bitcoin over the past 11 years? I'm sure he uh, would. I would, but, but just... I think we're going to let Kareem do it. Instead. This was a Kareem one. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, yeah. There was no K or B on there. So I just, you know. I, I get it, man. I get it. It's all right. I made a mistake. I'll admit it. Good luck, Kareem. (laughs) All right. So Bitcoin turns 11 today, October 31st. So you're listening to this uh, on the first of next month, of course. But we are recording on October 31st. Today is when Bitcoin turns 11 years old. And Coinbase published a blog post where they were just talking about the history of Bitcoin and a couple of signs that point to the growth of Bitcoin. And it was kind of cool. It was putting it in some historical context. So I wanted to share some of the more interesting stats, share our thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. So as a reminder, the Bitcoin white paper was published October 31st, 2008. We don't know anything about the creator other than that it wasn't Craig Wright. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's pretty much the only data point that we is, have. We that's the only data time. point we have. <laughs> Could have uh, been you. Could have been me. Yeah. Definitely not him. Maybe the creator hasn't been born. We just know that it wasn't Craig Wright. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, comparisons with other technology. Okay. Email. Well, let's start with the TV. The TV was invented in 1927. By the end of the 1940s, so almost 20 years later, only 2% of families in America owned a TV. And email which was invented in 1972 and it's free, right? You don't really, well. Wow, most, by Al Gore. <laughs> by, by Al Gore. <laughs> took, was, took, who does about as much for, for that as uh, Craig Wright did for Bitcoin. <laughs> it was invented in 1972. It took until 1997, so that's more than 20 years, to surpass 10 million users. 10 million people using email. So how does that compare with Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin was invented in 2008. And by 2019, it's got 27 million users in the US, which is about 9% of the population. So that's only 10 years. We see exponential growth. Of course, you might be thinking if you're listening to this, there's some caveats and it, it it's because it's not just because of Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin is building on the other technologies, right? The existing infrastructure allows it to move quicker. If Bitcoin was invented in 1972, I'm pretty sure <laughs> it wouldn't have gotten 27 million users that quickly. But still, it just shows the really rapid growth. That's crazy, though, to see the tech comparisons you, when you really view it that way, yeah, okay. Maybe some people, not everyone, is like Bitcoin for at least for a while. People were like, you know, maybe Bitcoin is just like a scam or whatever it is. But it seems like it's definitely a legitimate technology at this point. And to see that rate within 11 years compared to 25 years, I mean, that's crazy that Emo's made in 1972. However, I will say that it's it's a little unfair because – we live in a different world. The 25 years between 72 and 1997 compared to the technology advancements, like pale in comparison to technology advancements. 2008, I can't even really, we, I don't think, were iPhones out then? Maybe iPhone 1 was? No, 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 no. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You're 100%. And that this is exactly, you know, when we're talking about the infrastructure being there, like cryptocurrency gets to deploy faster into the world 
because of the infrastructure, societal infrastructure that was built with the internet, with TV, with cable, with communications, the fact that we can all, you know, you know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Bitcoin is born into a world more ready for change than, let's say, for example, email. And it just keeps getting exponential. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of crazy. What is the next big thing going to take two years for 100 million people to start using? I don't know. It, it certainly feels that way. I yeah. mean, you know, I was actually thinking about this when we were <laughs> – think about it this way. It seems kind of silly to say, but let's pretend that the TV hadn't been invented. Like we're in some alternate reality where cryptocurrency already exists and we had the internet and stuff, but like television wasn't invented. If TV came out today, how long before – millions and millions and millions of people have tv you know what i mean like immediately like because everybody would find out about it immediately because of the internet and be like i want that thing <laughs> you know it would take actually i don't know uh, because like depending on what we're thinking about as tv we already have the internet and youtube and stuff like that's kind of like backwards people well, are getting right, rid of right. their you're right that's a no, great point. I, I think when a kareem says tv i think he more means like uh some like sort TV of shows like or i don't know like well, do you mean like something that's like a portable technology that was, you know, basically TV was, was, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it's, yeah, I no, get look, look, all I'm saying is that, that yes, you're right to point out it, they're coming into different worlds, right? And the, like, it, the new technologies that come into this world just can spread easier. It's easier to move around. It's easier for the information to spread. Things become more accessible. So, you know. So to your point, though, let's say that there was no big screen option. It was either like you had a mobile phone and you had a movie theater. If there was something that was in between like that, that for whatever reason wasn't invented, I think it would catch on and people would be like, whoa, like I don't have to go to I can sit on my couch and I can also not like they would. It would definitely catch on very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, like it happened. Actually, do you know what White Claws are? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The drink. Well, Kareem knows what white claws are. They're they're his favorite drink. Well, what's no. fucking crazy is three months ago, none of us knew what it was, I and know. I mean, maybe one of us did, but like we'll say six months for sure. And it's crazy how connected we are. Whether we try to, even though we try to disconnect, and you know, we'll still somehow, even when you go out, like there will be effects from you know the internet and how like social media and everything that we will see in person very fast like birds or you know Dude, there's no question about it and even beyond technology even things such as supply routes right like let's say that this new product whatever the portable tv thing whatever it is that it's created somewhere if that product is popular enough that it wants to go to market how hard is it to get it to almost every country between amazon and walmart and all these international shipping like giants and all this like it's not hard to get things moved around the you world. You fill out some forms, you press a button, and then and there you it go. goes everywhere. Everything's yeah. already in its way, and you can get it there very quickly. You know, we forget, but like the original Amazon was Sears, and the guy got the idea because he was working on the railroads. So it was the first like connection between cities, and he's like, oh, snap. So he was like, if I remember correctly, he was putting the – he started putting a catalog, just selling watches to different stops. And he was one of the first person that could quickly go from city to city. And that's how Sears blew up. Wow. You know, the, like the first person to take advantage of the new existing infrastructure. So no question. These these things stack. And that's what makes it so powerful. All right. <clears throat> I want to keep going with some more uh, interesting observations. Google Trends, which, of course, is a good source of gauging interest. Some caveats that we'll add later. But according to Google Trends, interest for Bitcoin has been spreading globally. And the countries with the highest relative interest have actually been taking turns. Like It's like the idea blows up in different countries. So just to show you an example, in 2009, the highest relative interest in Google Trends for Bitcoin was Austria. Then in 2010, it was Kazakhstan. In 2011, it was Estonia. In 2012, it was Finland. In 2015, it was Ghana. In 2016, it was Nigeria. In 2017, it was South Africa, right? So we're seeing the, the idea spread and the interest blow up in different areas. And here in America, specifically in 2018, Bitcoin was Googled more than either royal wedding or election results. Now, the caveat I would add is I'm sure a lot of us put in Bitcoin to get to something else. It's not like we're looking, hey, what is Bitcoin, right? 
But whatever. The bottom line is that technically counts, I'd say. You know, yeah, it's not as specific as those other two things, but it's still within the umbrella of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. You know? All right, so there are currently 55,000 computers in 96 countries that are running a full node. So pretty distributed network. I have some very interesting statistics on that in a little bit. <clears throat> but also they mentioned that if over the last four years you had dollar cost average $10 a month, if you bought $10 a month in Bitcoin starting in October 2015, your yield would be 595%. So your $480 investment would be equal to $3,337. Wow. I, I will pause to remind you here that the source of this article is a publication is Coinbase, who makes money when you buy Bitcoin. So whatever. The fact's still there, <laughs> but just be mindful of who's writing this article. <laughs> However, another interesting thing that we've seen this year, one of the theses of Bitcoin, I think, has been proven true a little bit. And that is that it's going to provide an international, a global form of currency for people in economic turbulence. And we have seen a huge spike in Bitcoin volume traded in local Bitcoins in Venezuela, Argentina, Hong Kong. I actually put the chart here for you guys to look at. Of course, the links are in the show notes. You can go look at the blog post yourself. They have a lot of interesting images. But you can see Venezuela and, and Argentina really spiking over a long period of time, like more and more and more, it's only, you just see this gradual increase in adoption, trade, you know. And since we live in unstable times, it might be Argentina today and it might be a totally different country in, in 10 years or 15 years. But all of the people who lived through this in Argentina and went to Bitcoin, there's a generational memory there, you know. So it's not like that is lost in Argentina. I don't know. I, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts here. Like, what, what are what are your opinions here about like like what happens? Say the economy stabilizes ten years afterwards. Wouldn't you expect a significant portion of the population to like consider Bitcoin as a safety net basically for a really long time after that? Yeah, and or a savior. So it's interesting. I'm looking at the uh, the Venezuela one goes straight up. It's yeah. just like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the the Argentina one has massive spike, massive dip, and then it goes straight up. And the Hong Kong one looks similar at about the similar time. So it looks like that might be like the beginning of 2018, kind of like that they just kind of were on the hype train a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Whereas Venezuela doesn't appear to be on that same hype train. They appear to just be very slowly crawling up. But Hong Kong dipped pretty hard, which would probably look a lot like the actual dip of the price. Yep. But they also spiked really hard with what I believe is the protests being correlated. Yeah, that's right. And they just announced that their country is going into a recession. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch. Yeah. Yeah. And look, and the bottom line is the more that the people start turning towards this, uh, you know, one of the other quotes in the article was <clears> that <throat> out of people with high incomes, it was something like 75% of those who held crypto held Bitcoin. You know, so this is expanding. This is becoming really, really that kind of global thesis, uh, I think, is starting to play out. All right. I, I just wanted to mention that <clears throat> in compared with Venezuela, Argentina, or Hong Kong, Venezuela is 242 million. So every and Hong Kong and Argentina are 17 and 8 million. So it's like paling comparison for how much is being poured into Venezuela comparatively. And right. I yeah, it makes it even more dramatic. Just, that's I mean, a great point. That's kind of a crazy. It's a crazy rise that it just had from like 2016, 2000, early 2017 or something, where it's just basically straight up. And now it's kind of been dipping a little bit. But yeah, it's just this is kind of what happens when economies maybe go to shit. And and just to add to Domino's effect here, guys, because you just made me think, look, I'm from Colombia, so I'm kind of aware that along with the crisis in Venezuela, there's massive, massive, massive fleeting, right? Emigration, like people leaving the country because they're trying to find another opportunity. All of those millions of people that are leaving Venezuela are leaving behind millions of loved ones. And if they're able to manage to create new opportunities, they're going to try to find ways to send resources to these people. That's what remittances is all about, right? So it's not just that Bitcoin's blowing up in Venezuela, but that these networks that start going global 
have staying power. You know, like if those people are using Bitcoin to send it back to them, then they're increasing Bitcoin usage in their local community, whether they immigrated to the United States or to Colombia or to Europe. You know, you just start seeing the blockchains, basically. <clears throat> <laughs> the the dominoes, not the black things. There's a lot of black things. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, all right. Got I just pictured like a Russell Crowe beautiful mind moment where yeah. you're like <laughs> picturing all the blockchain <laughs> happening it's, between the people. They're so beautiful. I see them all. The all people right. become nodes. Speaking of beautiful, Brent, do you uh, want to tell us about those uh, cows on the blockchain? Because he sounds... will. He will. As soon as I'm oh. done with the story, we got one. <laughs> 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 so this is the last part guys actually i want to go back to this thing about the power because there was a quote in the coinbase article that blew my mind a little bit we know that bitcoin is the most secure blockchain right of course yeah everybody knows that it's got the most hashing power it's 108 million tera hashes per second currently which according to the coinbase blog is by far and away, the largest computational network ever created. So I was like, whoa, okay, that totally sounds like it could be right. But let me just go confirm. And I started trying to dig around online. And I found all of these articles from 2013, 2015, or maybe like one for 2017 that was talking about how the total computational power of Bitcoin is more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers combined many times over. It's like eight times more or 10 times more than all the supercomputers because you have all of this computing power geared towards Bitcoin. So it's not just the fact that it's the most secure blockchain. It actually is the largest, most powerful computer network that mankind has created, <laughs> which is kind of insane. Ding, 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 ding. That's pretty nuts. Would you know what the second largest is? Did it say? Uh, no, it didn't say, but it's may, probably may a, it might be Adam Ethereum. trying to do a Tron plug. <laughs> Wow. It's Tron. You're Kareem, it's Tron. It's not. It's not Tron. But anyway. All right. So let's now, uh, Brent. <laughs> Brent, those jokes are so good that we're going to pass on the next story. <laughs> on to you. <laughs> Cows and blockchains. Yeah. So did you ever want to get your meat but on blockchain? Of course. Well, it might be. It might just be happening. Now nah, I looked at. So I was looking this up. So. There's a lot of issues with supply chain stuff, more than I ever kind of really thought possible. So once I started working with Wild Foods, I learned a lot about some of the struggles on the back end of the blockchain and the stuff we need to go through to make sure our suppliers are actually doing what they say they're doing. Like when they say that like they're fair trade or they say they're organic, we have to go through more steps to see if they actually are because a lot of people will just lie and say that they are and they're not. So there's a huge due diligence on our end whenever we do that stuff. So this story caught my eye and it's been catching my eye. I've been trying to find a way to source something via blockchain. I would just start a new company and I would sell it to all y'all out there, whatever it is, coffee, meat, whatever. So maybe, I don't know, I reached out to these people already, so we'll see. But they are, they're being launched by a company called Wong Supermarket which is apparently Chilean. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I would never have, I don't know what's going on there. And they they are creating this little app where you can scan uh, your meat from this company called Suku, which I think is like, they put an extra U in SKU, I think is the idea there. And it's a US company that was founded by people who headed the blockchain part of Deloitte, which is like the auditing firm. So that was kind of weird that that's where they started from. But they are integrating this app with these stores in Chile, these Wong supermarkets. And they're developing it on that JP Morgan blockchain that we talked about, that Quorum blockchain, the permissioned one. So it's not decentralized or anything like that. But what they noticed, and this is a quote from the article, that you have a large group of consumers that want to buy sustainability and they want to buy transparent products from brands, but they don't do it today. They don't trust what the brands are saying. There's a $1 trillion market sitting there for companies and brands to take if they can speak the same language as those consumers. And it's true. We get tons and tons of questions, very specific ones that sometimes we don't even know the answers to. And we have to, because there are consumers who really want to know like who touched this, why they do it. So this app could even do, you know, if you say, if I'm a meat company and I say all of our cows have antibiotics given to them 
Well, now there's actually a third party that has to go in on this permission blockchain and say, yes, they all did. And whoever does the vaccinations or something. Now, obviously, there could be some corruption there or whatever, but but they're signing off and saying, yes, each every single one of these animals has been done. That's on the blockchain. You can see every step in the process on the app via blockchain all the way to direct to consumer. And apparently this was because Wong is kind of like a Whole Foods in Chile. They're like the small market that has like the higher end, more organic, sustainable group of food. And they were bought by a conglomerate called Sensosud. And everybody was pissed off because this is like, this would be like Walmart buying Whole Foods or something. Or like, I guess Amazon bought Whole Foods, which is kind of similar. But they, they're all like, they're going to ruin <laughs> all of the cool little things that we liked about Wong and why we use them. And so this Suku company moved in and they're working with this blockchain app. And apparently it's ready for deployment. This isn't like they might be doing this. They formed a partnership. They're like ready to go. So I think this is really, really sick because also this helps with everyone. You know, if there's a vegans or people that are like, you know, meat is so bad for you. It's hurting the environment or whatever. Well, now we can once everything gets set up and you're like, OK, is this organic? Cool. Is this grass fed cool all right now let's work on the emissions like aspect of it maybe you know and they can like this will help kind of give guidelines i think at some point with with an app like maybe that's taking a little too far down the road but i think it'll be somewhat help it'll, it'll be very helpful for the meat industry i think this is a very big deal um and i'm i'm into it no there's definitely a thing there so with with cows they have a massive effect on the environment because of their methane footprint or whatever, I think. But they, there is a way to raise them so that they don't do that. Now, I don't know enough about it, but I, the way I understand it, if you do it right, you can actually use the cows to, like, do something with each pasture and then move them so that, like, they, they are on this little square area and then they, like, eat all the grass. And then you move them to the next one. And because they ate all the grass, now you can plant something there that wouldn't have been able to be planted before if they didn't eat the grass. And then you literally move them around your entire farm that way, but nobody does it because it's way harder than just sticking them in a pen and feeding them shit. So if you wanted that to be how your meat gets to you and you wanted it to, there's a word for it. And I wish I knew off the top of my head. Uh, it, but if you wanted that to be the only kind of meat you buy, you could look, scan it and be like, okay, it qualifies. Cool. They're from that farm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's super interesting. And, you know, from like a bigger trends too, I feel like this is more of that shift from just efficiency to sustainability and accountability because it's like we're really, we can be really good and efficient, but like we can be too efficient, you know, and not care about other things. Yeah. there And consumers don't know, like when you buy meat, you don't know whether they've been factory farmed or whether it's something else for the most part, a very small subset of consumers do the easier you make it. And you can literally see this meat costs $10.18 and this one costs $10.05. But I know that this one is not contributing to any sort of climate change or whatever. Yeah, or then you can make it first. <laughs> literally yeah. in the case yeah. of some, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there, there's a lot of problems with like cocoa supply, all that. The supply chain has always been one of those things that I thought was a really clear use case for, for blockchain. I'm excited to see it come to fruition 100 no percent, no doubt plus they both have the word chain in it so it's a match made in heaven. all right all right and i guess uh you know that was great talking about cows now brent do you want to continue this hot streak uh talking about bitmain yes yeah, so there's not a, a whole lot to talk about here there's some weird shit going on at bitmain uh bitmain of course being one of the biggest mining firms that exist i know they have like some ties with bitcoin cash I think they did a lot of investment in that. I think it was Bitmain. Anyway, could be wrong on that. But they're definitely one of the biggest ones in existence, even though their market share has been kind of slowly going down. Well, they got rid of their co-founder and executive director, and his name was McCree Ketuan Jean. Jean, 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 Jean. Is, is it Zan? Like, D-H-A-N. We're not really sure. I think you I think said it pretty close to right. I think that's Jean. Jean. <clears throat> anyway, he's gone. And Coindesk reported this, so I'm just kind of regurgitating a lot of what they said. But they got an email first. This is how this started. That was sent to them that was apparently an internal email. And the internal email said, Bain's co-founder, chairman, legal representative, and executive director, Jihan Wu, 
has decided Jian Wu is the one obviously that we recognize more than John has decided to dismiss all roles of Ketuan John effective immediately. Any Bitmain staff shall no longer take any direction from John or participate in any meeting organized by John. Bitmain may, based on the situation, consider terminating employment contracts of those who violate this note. Wow. So I, this isn't even something that I even think could fly in the U.S. They're literally like, if you talk to this guy, you're fired. So that's crazy. So they sent that out. And, but there was no information in that email as to why they fired him. So that kind of came up a couple days later. They had an all-hands all meeting on Tuesday to discuss what was happening. And uh, Coindesk was able to get some info from that as well. They apparently, a while ago, Wu had stepped away from Bitmain as the in December 2018 from the active day-to-day -day role. And he had a massive falling out with Jean. And it resulted that Wu and him can't work together. And apparently this has been brewing since 2015. And they've had, like, basically, they're the two founders and they can't stand each other. And it's been that way for years. And the big point of contention was they had a lot of major layoffs in 2018. And John didn't want to fire anybody. He's like, basically, crypto was crashing kind of. And he didn't want to fire anybody because he figured it would come back up and they needed to keep everybody. And Wu said, no, we need to fire people. And I don't know if it would have worked if they didn't fire people, but they uh, they did. So at the time, John tried to seize control and kind of take over a bunch of operations as they were firing people. He wanted more. He wanted more control over why or how or something. So <laughs> in the meeting. Jian Wu starts throwing shade, saying that, like, Jean is just super insecure, so he let him have the chairman role because otherwise he would cry. And uh, as soon as they made him chairman, all the other companies pulled their credit lines from them and started calling in the credit that they owed. And if Bitcoin hadn't bounced back, that they probably would have ceased to exist as a company because, I guess, like, these he's saying the banks had no confidence in this other guy. Which, this is coming from Jian Wu. We don't know the other side of the story. This guy hasn't said anything. So uh, he's just saying, like, that's what happened. Bitmain's hash rate and total market share, dominance, and all of their equipment have been on the decline ever since then. And John wanted to move them away from mining Bitcoin into an AI sector. So he kept talking about, like, using employees to buy this old AI company that, like, they're using, sorry, funds to buy this old AI company, funds they didn't have to buy a company with 300 employees who were completely burnt out, who didn't want to do anything with the company anymore. He was buying just like this basically complete shit company. And uh, again, this is Jihan Wu's spin on it. I have no idea what is actually accurate and what isn't. But they have a small AI division where they use venture capital, but they have no venture capital left to put in there. <laughs> so Jihan's like, you can't invest our venture capital if we don't have any. And he was just talking about going and doing another round of funding or doing another or waiting until the US IPO comes through and then taking the money that they raise in the US IPO and investing it that way, even though the US IPO would be for the for the crypto mining company and not an AI company. So also kind of funny, he's banned from the premises. He can't even go there to, to his own offices. And maybe this will end up hurting their chances at that US IPO that they've been that they've been touting. Who knows? But some interesting drama. And as more information comes out. We'll talk about it some more because I'm sure it'll be fun. Uh, so I think that Jiwon Wu, he was there at the beginning as well, right? Like, just Yeah, they co-founded okay. it together. So have you ever you, have you heard of Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz, the venture capital fund? Yes. Um, so I listened to an audio book by him called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And one of the big takeaways for me was he talked, it basically talks about business and startups and how startups are fucking impossible to run, but they're super like, he loves it, but also it's going to be a really tough time running a, a business. And he said that when a company goes from 10 employees to 100, that person that was running that company for 10, maybe to its optimal you know, point in its optimal way could no longer do it. It's like you need a new person with more experience who understands how to run a hundred people as opposed to 10. Like it's a different skill set, almost a hundred to a thousand and so on, you know? So it kind of just feels like 
this guy who co-founded it all of a sudden has been, you know, this is what kind of happens sometimes where a co-founder goes rogue because they still, they have a huge ego attachment to it. They, they have other visions. They, you know, and sounds like he probably should move on and start his own. Yeah, the here is Jihan Wu is no saint. So it's not like we're talking about like Charles Hoskinson having a problem with somebody in his company. We can be like, no, Charles is doing the right thing. Jihan Wu has definitely done some things where we're like, that guy's an idiot. So, I don't know what to believe here. This is just what we know so far. And it's definitely interesting that there's such strife at the upper levels. Yeah. And actually, if you really think about it, it, when this company was started, Bitcoin was so fringe. It's just a couple of dudes that are like, hey, let's start mining this Bitcoin thing. And then it it balloons into this, into Bitmain. So that's what I mean. It's just these five guys in their home office or whatever, just screwing around. And all of a sudden they're making so much money and they decide, hey, we got to try something. Let's do this. Which is why he makes more. Him sending out or throwing shade. Maybe it's normal in, in Chinese business. I have no idea. But he's out there like throwing shade at people and telling them they're banned from the office. And if you talk to them, you're fired. Like, that's the kind of thing that somebody who's never experienced, like, any sort of uh, anything like that would do. Barstool uh, Dave Portnoy did that a couple of weeks ago, and he got uh, on on the Internet. He basically, Wait, what? Yeah, there was a guy who uh, I think there were it, it was like some sort of union. Not, there was a union debate and he like retweeted this guy saying to barstool hey if you guys need any help with unionizing let me know and then he retweeted that guy and quoted it and said if any of you guys talk to him you're fired on the spot and then he had to delete the uh tweet wow and, uh, yeah so you know maybe china i don't know but it definitely happens here too oh absolutely well it happens here but it's not legal which is why he had to delete that tweet yeah I mean, yeah, it's totally you... legal. What do you mean? The U.S. has w- w- some of the friendliest uh, anti-union laws anywhere. Like, it, it probably had more to do with public perception. In the U.S., almost more than anywhere, you can get away with taking steps to prevent your employees from unionizing. Wow. Yeah, interesting. Good old Jihan Wu. It'll be, <laughs> it won't be the first. It won't be the last time in the news, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. That's it for that. I think it's time to investigate the world let's start with kareem and china 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 has been in the news guys but this time it's actually more crypto related there's been a lot of buzz because a couple of signals from the chinese government well pretty clear signal how about this yeah. <laughs> a couple of signals yeah uh, winnie the pooh found his honey <laughs> so president z told in a meeting with the communist party that he wanted everyone to start increasing their focus and investment in blockchain technology on top of that you had a official at the central bank urging commercial banks to step up their applications of blockchain technology And in response to President Xi's comments, you're starting to see developments such as where it's now you're no longer allowed to share articles that say blockchain is a scam, basically. Or not that you can't share them, but, you know, that the publications aren't writing them anymore. Yeah, I I love that that it's like, okay, she says blockchain's cool, and now all of a sudden their censorship goes the other direction. Yeah. (laughs) They'll flip-flop it. Dude, no question about it. So before I go on, this is, I know we've hinted on this before, and I'm trying to like say this as dispassionately as possible because I don't approve of the actions of the Chinese government, of course. But just from like a historical perspective, it's scary how much they can get on one page, on one direction at a time. It's literally unfathomable to think of yeah. our government being able to sh- to pivot or change gears in any kind of functional way. It's completely impossible. And these guys have a meeting, they make a couple of decisions, and 1.2 billion people are now going in a particular direction. It's absurd. Like, I know I'm simplifying it, and there's more. I'm just saying, it's really crazy. Well, that's the plus of dictatorship, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I I would have what you want. In theory, a dictatorship. But the the, like, Mm -hmm. what I would say is, if they weren't, 
violating human rights at every turn, this would be really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But do they go hand in hand? Well, I guess that's the only way you can do right, it. Right, exactly. Is this possible without trampling over people's rights? And... Yeah, could, could you do it without gulags? Probably. I don't know. But What's a gulag? Like a, a concentration camp. Dude, oh, okay. The Chinese are running concentration camps right now. Like, yeah, there's straight up, almost no difference. It's, it's getting pretty absurd, like almost Nazi level. Like it's not Jews, it's Muslims, but like they, yep. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's not to mention all the censorship stuff. But, but anyway, I mean, they... <laughs> I mean, to continue, of course, this caused an uproar. So there was – here's some specific quotes from Xi because I think it's important. Number one, he did call for greater investment, as I mentioned. He was quoted as saying specifically that he thinks blockchain is going to play an important role in the next round of world innovation and industrial transformation is what he called it. And he wants China to have an edge over other countries when it comes to research and development. And this part, you know, we were talking about technology earlier. The wider goal is he wants blockchain or he sees that blockchain is going to demand deep integration with other information technologies, including AI, big data, and the Internet of Things. And, you know, reading this, if you guys actually think about the possible implications of each one of those technologies and to think that they're actually going to converge, it's not just that we have big data now and it's not just that we have the blockchain now and it's not that we have AI, but that those three things are eventually going to be part of the same process and AI with blockchain access that can analyze massive data. Like, it's almost like we're not ready, man. The exponential growth here is just unfathomable. <laughs> Throw in yeah. quantum computers. Yeah, it's. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> we're gonna live through one of the most interesting yeah. times in human history. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a couple things to say. One, the U.S. better get their. Uh, this is the probably one of the best things that that the for any crypto enthusiast, American crypto enthusiast, can, wants to hear because there's no way that the U.S. government is just gonna let. China just become the the leaders in blockchain innovation in the world. Like it, it might happen, but they're like U.S. is not going to be far behind. They're gonna no, they can't I, they can't see past red and blue to fucking get anything yeah, done. Yeah, no, and and the system has been completely taken over by corporate interests that are each going in their own specific direction. There's not, I don't really see the collective social investment. I, I don't see. I mean. Maybe I hate to say this because <laughs> it's not something I approve of, but the only place where I see it in the government is like the Defense Department. Yeah, they're dumping billions of dollars into all kinds of research and all kinds of technology, and that's going to obviously impact American society. But I don't really see our institutions going in, in one collective direction of investment right now. Well, I mean, I would think that of all the topics that seem to be red or blue or, you know, that we've seems like crypto is one of those that is kind of on both sides. And I think a lot of the people that probably don't like it probably don't understand it as well as they it's should. Only currently kind of feels like it's on both sides because one side hasn't taken an opinion on it yet. Like as soon as, say, Republicans decide that they're pro-crypto, then that just means Democrats are going to decide that they're not. Yeah, so, and I'm not so sure about that because on I the Democratic so. side, there's a deep distrust of financial. Are, 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 do you, are, are the Republicans, would Republicans 20 years ago, 25 years ago, say that they were pro internet? And then Democrats would be like, no, we don't want the internet. It's just a technology. There was know? more crossover in vote 25 years ago, though. Like, if you see, like, the, the I saw a graph of it where it was like the times that the Republican slash Democrat or whatever the two opposite sides were across the aisle. And you can see, like, how often one voted for a bill that was put up by the other, and now it's almost nothing. There's it's almost awesome. never no, yeah, an overlap. You right. can find some overlap with certain topics, and I happen to think this is one of them. And I hope it is, yeah, because we need to get uh, caught moving. up. The one thing yeah. that I will say is technologically, we're still – I mean, the United States is still pretty far ahead in a lot of ways, and it's still a massive economy. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen overnight, and I also – I'm not convinced that the Chinese system is stable over time. Like, I don't know that, you know, look at Hong Kong. Is that ever going right. to spread? Like, we don't know. But it is almost frighteningly powerful how quickly they can shift gears. Um, yeah. 
It's also crazy that people are very anti-China. And then as soon as something like this comes out and then crypto start like having like a little a good week because, you know, the Chinese president said something that everyone was just like, yeah, but it's like the whole reason that you're excited right now is because of China. You know, <laughs> well, no doubt. And it's that's that was the whole point of the South Park episode about integrity, right? Like it's we all have integrity until there's a direct financial incentive and China, maybe more than almost any other country in recent history, is learning is using that leverage of financial interest. Basically, you can't say anything. You can't even put a map that we disagree with on a movie because that's like game over. <laughs> yeah. Or you can't even favor a tweet or else you get banned right. from the country you, like Zed. Even if you're a musician, that has nothing yep. to do like – yeah, yep. exactly. Anyway, the last thing I will say though is that the response to this Chinese uh, kind of pro – Blockchain comment from the market was, of course, ecstatic. They bought, crypto surged, and the Communist Party's newspaper, the People's Daily, basically tried to tamper expectations and said, hey, uh, you know, blockchain, here's the quote, blockchain's future is here, but we must remain rational. The rise of blockchain was accompanied by that of cryptocurrencies. But innovation in blockchain does not mean that we should speculate on virtual currencies. So pretty strong statement saying don't mistake right. our interest in blockchain for our interest in all these cryptocurrencies you guys have out there. Well, think about the application of blockchain for an authoritarian government. If they can get access to all of that data by being behind this great innovation, but also creating it so that they can no longer have their privacy. Yeah. And I think that that it's, uh, you know, not to extend this too much, but I do think that a lot of people feel on the left and on the right that the global economic order is on its last legs in some way, right? Like the way that the dollar is in control. And we know that different countries like Iran and Russia and China are trying to create a different pole of power when it comes to financial power. And also we know that there's separation between Europe and North America. So, Things are changing, and if blockchain is going to be a part of that, then there is going to be power and being first mover advantage. You have the opportunity to create more of what the new economic order in the world is going to look like. And I have no doubt that countries that can actually take a shot at that are going to try to pursue it aggressively. Yeah. Anyway, enough China. We dragged it long enough. Interesting point of discussion. But let's go further west or further east. You could pick a direction because the planet's round. Ye Are you Croatia. sure about that? <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, yeah. So Croatia, the it's called the it's a I guess it's a non governmental organization, the NGO. That's what that means. It's this Ubik U B I K moves go governance to the blockchain. And I guess what UBIK is, is a Croatian blockchain and cryptocurrency association. And they, on November 1st, you're going to be able to vote or use, use it on the Ethereum blockchain in the form of a DAO using Aragon. Now, pop quiz, what is a DAO? Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It's like a company with no owner. Yes, you guys nailed the pop quiz. A pluses for both of you. And <laughs> so I actually think this is really cool. Aragon is, has been around for a bit and they've been, I think, one of the earlier governance coins that I've seen. And they've been they've been working very diligently hard and uh, diligently hard. Nice, nice, hey, nice words. Diligently Adam. Hard. Yes. So. I think this is really cool. If you belong to the association, you actually get the right to 10 reputation tokens. Board members get 100 tokens. And then you'll be like asked to vote on certain things. And I think it's if one, sorry. So sometimes to me, the DAO is a little abstract. I feel like I haven't ever used one. So like I get it, but I kind of don't. And I feel like just like I need, I should probably just, try to find a simple DAO or something and see how it all works. Look, think about it this way. A corporation is an organization, right? That's all yeah. it is. 
we take a bunch of people together and we organize it. Depending on the size, it might have more complexity. So if it's small, a bunch of us could just make the decision. But as the company gets bigger, we need to assign, let's say, for example, executives and people who appoint executives, which would be the board of directors. The power is concentrated in the board of directors, ultimately, even though the holders as a whole would vote for the board of directors. The DAO is basically from my view, a continuation and the ability to create these types of organizations. But now because of the automatic, because of the technology, we can get rid of the layer of, let's say, the board of directors, and we could have more direct democracy, or we could have more autonomous systems so that we get rid of layers of power that don't need to be there. But it's basically that, just an organization doing X, Y, Z. It could be for profit, for not profit, for a blockchain, whatever. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Thank you, Kareem. And we should actually soundbite that maybe and uh, just keep it, you know, <laughs> Dow, put it on YouTube real quick. But so, yeah, and and to what you're saying, the board members will get 10x what an average member gets, which, I mean, you're on the board, you have a lot of decisions. I guess you deserve some sort of, you know, extra, you know, clout. And I think this will be really cool for Croatia and just having a – you know, a system like this working, I think, oh yeah, it is the first DAO that will be used to group decisions and will be, sorry, it'll be the first blockchain in the world to do such a thing in an official capacity. Pretty cool. So I, I'm kind of missing, an NGO is non-government, so I official capacity, anyway, it's interesting to look at, and also Croatia is one of those places that's been on my list to, to travel to for a long time. Yeah, really Croatian good. Yacht Week sounds pretty awesome. What? <laughs> so yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, no. Like Some, Croatia is littered with like big time yachts, bunch of rich people. In the there. summer, it's it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and there are yachts everywhere. People party. There's a lot of good music. Go there. Yeah. Oh, cool. So any of our listeners that have a yacht at Croatia Block Week or Yacht Week, Croatia Block, we're happy to come join week. you. So you know, just reach out to us at uh, Crypto Basic Podcast at Gmail dot com. Yeah. And we won't even charge for our appearance. <laughs> so I do want to just say one more thing that they did have voting earlier in the year, but it was using a lot simpler of a version. Like they use QR codes and a temporary wallet that wasn't on Ethereum. And it ended up like it just wasn't good. People stopped using it. And then uh, there was it was simpler for the non-technical users. So that will be one thing is like the onboarding of you know, the less savvy users are going to have to get MetaMask or, or Frame. And, you, yeah, they're just going to have to use a, a proper blockchain wallet in order to access all the stuff. But ultimately, proper. once they learn it, it'll be pretty awesome for, you know, the Ubi, Ubik, U-B-I-K. U-B-I-K. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like something that the Yang Gang might get behind. Yang Gang. <laughs> it's the universal basic income yeah. I don't know what the K would stand for. Yang of Kareem. Of Kareem. <laughs> Andrew Yang came out in uh, pro online poker last week. Yes, I saw that. He did. Super pumped. I, Very good uh, alignment because we're all big fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be – I didn't even think any candidate would mention it. Uh, I can't wait for that. Yeah, he, he – it sounds like he's played because the way he wrote about it, like he – I remember reading it. I was like, oh, somebody who plays online poker wrote this. Dude, he's just educated about everything, which can you imagine like – oh, it's absurd. This presidential candidate thinks that he should educate himself on topics he talks about. I've never seen anything like it. We should <laughs> – Crazy. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. No, what are you talking about? Yeah. It, look, these topics aren't hard if you're smart and you just have to know them. Yeah. <laughs> You, know, you guys didn't get that reference. There was a Trump yes. said that the that the that Syria was easy if you're smart. Yeah, everything's easy. <laughs> Everything is easy if you're the biggest genius in the world with the biggest brain. So yeah, fair enough. That's true. That's a good point. Uh, okay, yeah. let's wrap it up because we're talking Trump, and we could go on for another nope. hour or yeah, we'll another podcast right episode there. about that. We'll, <laughs> we'll spare the listeners our uninformed opinion. Our, our still our num our only negative review is because we released that one show like a year and a half ago about Trump. I don't know why we did that. I don't know why I let you do that, Kareem. Stop blaming it on me. It was your idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't involved at the time. No, but you guys, no. yeah. Typical Brent with his manipulation. <laughs> All right. Well, don't forget that we're not financial advisors. We are just a couple of guys that love crypto. Read some news. Patreon. Patreon. Right. 
Any anything to talk about? We don't have any new uh, new Patreon members, but please join the Patreon. And also, if you were waiting on those tokens, please get like I might have lost your address because that took so damn long. I'm good. I'm sending out the tokens now, so please send me your engine address if you are a Patreon member, and I will get you your tokens. Send to me on Discord, on Patreon, anywhere. All right. So yes, not financial advisors. Please do your own research. Calm down when Lord She the Pooh says something. You know, maybe you don't just go crazy. I don't know, but. Figure it out. Do your own research, and uh, all investments have inherent risk. We're just morons, boys. Don't you tell me how to speculate. I am an idiot. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can put that oh. in the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you waited until the end of the episode to find a front thing, that is good. <laughs> yeah. We've had a lot of good content, a lot of good sound bites. See you guys next week. Uh, yeah. Adam, Brent, and Kareem signing off. <laughs>